of vile sins of the flesh that we crucified in repentance, cast the evil eye of the flesh from us in repentance, and escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. Free indeed, Jesus called it. What are you free from if you're not free from the things that are going to make you a slave to whom you'll obey, as he told the Pharisees, that disqualify you from the kingdom, that you're supposed to crucify in repentance. That's another thing. As long as he did it all for you, and everything's transferred to you magically, and you got the magic cloak, well then, there's no need to crucify anything. See, you're walking in the light, the eye is good, the whole body's full of light, you're cleansed of all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, you're doing what is right, that's what, that's the faith is imputed as righteousness, because it does what is right, producing righteousness, producing the fruit of righteousness, and sinneth not, fit for the master's use. That's what the scriptures teach of a person walking in Christ. Not sinning willfully against their knowledge of the truth all day long. Like Romans chapter 6 talks about. For this we know. That our old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he that has died has been freed from sin. See you come to newness of life. For if we've died with him we believe we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead. And dies no more. Sin no longer has dominion over him. It's no longer going to have dominion over you if you don't present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. And you raise to newness of life in repentance. This is not something that happened figuratively. No, this is something that happens in repentance where you put to death the deeds of the body. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Back to Galatians 5. In the past, done, once and for all, not to be repeated. Why? Because if you sin willfully again, if you think you got a magic cloak and you go on and you, you think you can sin, no sacrifice remains because it's already been performed. If you've been reconciled through the blood once, truly, cleansed, walking in the light, filled with the Spirit, and then you violate that by committing sins unto death, like I said, you are in dire, dire circumstances. I deal with people that are coming out of this mess all the time that are in that very circumstance, and they think that it's over for them. Because they've sinned past the point of no return like Esau. Well, there's a possibility that, that happened, yes. Hearts get very hard in sin. Because under this mess, you think sin humbles you. You think the sin that you commit all day long and you admit you have in you all the time and the mess up and the, all, that, all that kind of thing is what humbles you. But that's what hardens you. Don't you see the difference? That's, the, that's what's talked about, the deceitfulness of sin springing up, defiling many. And then it gives you the illustration of Esau, a profane man that scoffed at these things and waited too long to try to reclaim his birthright. He sought it bitterly with tears that wasn't to be found. I'm not trying to scare the folks that are in the process of coming out. I, like I said, I deal with a lot because of this horrible mess that they've been under. But yes, you should be fearful of God. You should be in fear and trembling. Just come before him and empty yourself of guile. Quit playing games. You know what's in your heart. You know what's keeping you separated from him. It's a sin that separates you. It's like it says all through the scriptures. Your iniquities have separated you. My hand is outstretched all day long, he tells in the book of Isaiah. Read those passages. There's great promise in that. As wicked as those people were in idolatry, in fallen condition, but his hand was outstretched. My hand is outstretched. He keeps saying it. Four times in one chapter. But see, it's not going to do you any good unless come, let us reason together. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. Mercy is there to be had, yes. That's what the mercy seat is about. To be restored to favor through the cleansing of the blood. But it's not a license to sin. It's not past, present, and future. It's not a magic cloak. See, in this manner, we put to death, once and for all, 
not to be repeated in the process of repentance before that you can be granted forgiveness of your past sins and indwelt by the Holy Spirit in a vessel fit for the Master's use that is scrubbed and clean. That's what the Scriptures teach. And many of you just don't understand that. And I can see that because who you listen to on your channels and who you think is preaching a sound message. Mixing all the air into what Christ did on the cross. No, Christ died on the cross to release you from the bondage of sin. Not to take your place. Not to become sin. Not to have some punitive justice poured out on him instead of you. No punitive justice. There was no wrath involved there. His offering to God was a sweet smelling aroma unto God. There was no sin involved. He bore his sins in his body, yes. He took on our iniquities so that we can follow in his footsteps, so that we can be released from bondage, ransomed from who we sold ourselves for nothing. You shall be redeemed without money, Isaiah said. Just as the Bible directs in 1 Peter chapter 2, 22-24, you follow in his footsteps, die to sin, and live to righteousness. And if that don't happen in repentance, well, then you're constantly going to be your eyes bad, never cast out in repentance, you're lying to yourself because you're not keeping what he said. You're not make, even making any effort to go and sin no more because you think you're going to mess up all the time. So it's a sin-confessed existence in which you think you have something with God. Well, you really have nothing but judgment because the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. The wrath didn't come on Jesus in your place. The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Check it out in Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians 3. But see, all this has got to happen by you doing your part in salvation and him doing his to energize your efforts through grace. See, grace is the power to deny ungodliness. It's what energizes the faith, faithful obedience that we put forth in our first act of repentance. Grace empowers. It's mercy and forgiveness that's the free gift of past sins remitted by his blood. That's the free gift. In exchange for our living sacrifice on that altar of mercy to approach him to be returned to favor through repentance and faith proven by deeds. That's why grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. To run the race with endurance and work out our salvation and add to our faith so they don't fall back into these vile things of, of our life and then try to make some kind of theology about it that we can pick up where we left off. It doesn't happen that way, folks. That's why it's such a mess out there now. See, both dynamics have to be in place. The synergy, the working together with God that so few people will even grasp. That, that, word, that word's in the Bible, okay? When it says workers together with him, that's the word synergy. Two things working together to produce a result that cannot otherwise be achieved. Well, it cannot otherwise be achieved to have your past sins remitted by his blood and the free gift of forgiveness without you putting forth the effort to do your faithfulness and fidelity in your obedience to produce deeds worthy of repentance. That's why you're a slave to whom you obey. That act of volition that you put forth to mess up and sin confess and you have John 1.8 and you got, you got sin dwelling in you all the time, that makes you a slave to sin because you're a slave to whom you obey, as Paul said. Obedience unto righteousness or sin unto death. And it's always the worst kind of sins. Always. Whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether it be sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked, though you were a slave to sin, you sold yourself into that bondage, you obeyed from your heart. You didn't obey for you. Repentance is not a gift. Repentance is a command. It's an imperative command that you must obey. You obeyed from your heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Having been set free from sin, you became slaves or servants of righteousness. That's what happens. The first act of faith, obedience to the truth. Or it's the faith of devils. It's of no value. You commit sin, you're a slave to sin. You produce paeo, you're producing sin. So it's very dangerous for you to assume that you can commit sins unto death that are said to disqualify you from the kingdom in the scriptures very clearly, like all these people are I assume are talking about because that's all they all I see posted on the blogs and the channels 
is constant falling into pornography and addictions and domestic violence and abusive spouses and all, just even molestations.